we're gonna start our tour of the digestive system right at the beginning of the GI tract, right? Where we take food in uh, at the oral cavity, so starting in the mouth. And in the mouth is where digestion actually begins. We have, uh, we have saliva in our mouth and our saliva does contain some enzymes that are active right, right from the get-go. Um, so one of the things that really helps with digestion is just to mechanically break the food down into smaller pieces rather than having a, a whole bite uh, that has to be digested Let's, let's break it down into smaller little fragments and then carry out digestion on each of those fragments. So chewing is the thing that allows us to, to do that, allows us to break food down into smaller bits. And there's a name for chewing, it's called mastication. To masticate something means to chew it. And breaking it down into smaller pieces makes it easier for the saliva um, to, to work on the food that you're chewing. So saliva, what does saliva contain? It does contain mucus, which is very important for helping the food to be able to slide along through the tract. Um, saliva also has antimicrobial agents, so first line of defense against pathogens that might be in that food that you're chewing up uh, is right there in the saliva. There are antimicrobial substances. Uh, there are also enzymes, enzymes such as salivary amylase, and this again begins begins the digestion of starch. Um, digestion of starch will finish later on in the small intestine, but it gets a start right here in the mouth. Once we're done chewing, we have to swallow food. Swallowing is actually a very complex thing. You might not have thought about it before, but there are a lot of muscles involved in swallowing. The name for swallowing, the formal name for sw swallowing is deglutition. So mastication followed by deglutition. This starts the food moving down through the GI tract. So to initiate swallowing, this is something that we have voluntary control over. Uh, muscles of the mouth, including the tongue, allow us to mix the food around and move it towards the back of the mouth. And at the back of the mouth, uh, when, when we swallow food, it's in a form called a bolus. A bolus is just kind of like a a, a glob, a glob of food, and that bolus is what's going to move down the tract and be carried by peristalsis. So to start this off, in the oral cavity we have voluntary control of the muscles that act on the bolus, um, but as soon as we move that food to the very back of the mouth, things just kind of take over and it's an involuntary process from that point onwards. So uh, what I'd like you to know about the, the second part here, the in the pharyngeal area. Um, I'm going to point over to the pictures over here on this side. Okay, so at this point there have to be a couple of key things to happen. Um, the food has been in the mouth. This is the tongue right here. So the food has been in the mouth. We've used our tongue to move it back um, into this area and this is where things are going to become automatic, involuntary. So one thing that's really important, when we swallow food, we don't want the food to go up into the nasal cavity. It, it happens on occasion, but we don't generally want that to happen. That's not good. Uh, we want it to go down and be digested. So one thing, just right off the bat right there, the soft palate, which um, has this sort of dangly thing down, this is called a uvula. Uvula is this thing, you can see it in the back of your mouth. You look in the mirror. Um, the uvula is flexible. The uvula bends in order to close off that opening into the nasopharynx. Okay, so that happens. And then there's also this other little flap. This is called the epiglottis. What the epiglottis does is it bends downwards in order to close off um, the airways, right? You're breathing air in, air goes through the th over the vocal cords down um, in the conducting zone of the respiratory system. And we don't want the food to go down there. The food should not go towards the lungs. We want it to go down the esophagus instead. So that epiglottis folds downwards and closes off um, the airways. So these are things that right? You don't have voluntary control over. You can't think about moving your epiglottis. It, it just kind of happens when you swallow. Um, and then once the food makes it past the epiglottis, now we're in the, the esophageal area, and this is where peristalsis takes over, which is also automatic. These waves of muscular contraction are going to work to carry the bolus of food um, down towards the stomach. So that's the mouth and swallowing. Let's just continue right on down that esophagus. So the bolus is moving downwards and we can see this peristaltic wave. So the muscle would contract 
um, right here, and then at the next point in time, it's gonna contract right about here. That'll squeeze the food downwards, squeeze the bolus downwards, um, so that bolus of food travels down the esophagus. Total length for the esophagus is about 10 inches. It's a fairly good length tube, and it takes the bolus to the stomach. So a couple of important things. The esophagus is lined with epithelium that is not keratinized. So remember keratin, what does keratin do? Keratin provides kind of like a waterproofing layer on the surface of your skin, on the outside of your body. Um, so if we're talking about epithelium that is not keratinized, one thing that's very important for this epithelium is that it is kept moist. If it is not kept moist, then it's gonna dry out because it's non-keratinized. It's just gonna be losing water all of the time. So this is another reason why it's so important to have that, that mucus lining, um, that was wet surface um, lining the GI tract. It helps to protect those very cells, keeps them healthy. So at the lower end of the esophagus, when the bolus makes it down to the bait, to the lower end of the esophagus, there's actually a sphincter right there that ordinarily closes off the esophagus from the stomach. That sphincter has to open in order for the bolus to make it into the stomach. They haven't labeled the sphincter in the image here, but the sphincter would be right about here. It's just providing a separation between uh, the esophagus, this tube, and the stomach, which is coming up next. Um, okay, so that sphincter, it's important for a, uh, for a couple of reasons. When we get to the stomach, in the very next video, we're going to be seeing that the stomach, the stomach is very acidic. The stomach makes hydrochloric acid, and we need to keep that acid contained. If there was not a sphincter here, then some of that acid would travel back up into the esophagus and actually eat away at the cells lining the esophagus. And and that can cause damage. Um, symptoms would be heartburn if that's taking place. So it's important for that sphincter valve to remain closed unless we need to let some food go by. So it only opens when a bolus is in the process of traveling through.